what are some of the biggest gaps in our understanding of flow, particularly in regard to how we enter into a flow state and what took you down the path to writing this paper? Nobody had yet proposed anything for the neural dynamics of the network level of the brain or the neurobiology of flow state onset. People had started to do over the past 10 years, I think that's right, Michael, mm. um, better work on, on sort of the neurobiology, the state itself, but how do we get there? So we actually reviewed a paper um, called The Brain and Flow from Alameda in 2020, it's published in 2022. There's a lot of research about what happens when you're in the brain, what, when you're in the flow state, but method, that's methodologically very difficult, right? It's kind of tricky to get people in flow and put an EEG cap or put sure. them in fMRI scanners and get them in flow, let alone actually find out methodologically, okay, wait a second, you're not in flow now. Now let's get you in flow and see that transition. So it's a method, it's also a methodological issue of the difficulty of studying this. I have been looking at the question of flow and the question of extreme stress one way or another since, uh, I mean, I, I, I devote a chapter to it in West of Jesus. And so I like at least the early 2000s, I've been, I've been looking at this question of the relationship between extreme stress, the fight, freeze and flee response and flow. Like those questions have been there and there's work um, that I built on when I was writing Was to Jesus done by a guy named Rob Schultes um, that I think is the first time I've seen in the popular literature. And this is like 1986, kind of a neurobiological breakdown. And he took what was then sort of the existing endorphin hypotheses about flow, and then he tacked down a bunch of stuff we were learning about extreme stress. So I've been looking at this question uh, one way or another for about 20 years, and what happened was we were doing uh, our inaugural event in Miami. Heidi Williams was in the audience, and I was talking about the fight, freeze, or flee response, and I mentioned casually that some people believed there's no such thing as a freeze response that it's actually what happens when you get fight and, and flee at the same time and the body freaks out and freezes. And it was just sort of like a casual aside, oh, this, you know, anecdote in the literature, interesting. And, and Heidi literally just called bullshit almost immediately. If you, if you know her, she uh, is not shy. And if you're like, that's not true, you need to look at this, the, the work on PTSD. Um, you got to revisit some of these ideas. And I smiled and said okay yes i'll do that and you know inside i was like god damn it somebody just proved me wrong on stage and you know um every yeah uh, favorite moment I, when you're giving a talk <laughs> I, I, I was petulant i was a little petulant and uh that's fine <laughs> um that I, I don't mind when that happens to me because it made me go home and start doing the research and, and what i realized very very quickly was that the, the a lot of my earlier ideas and these earlier ideas were very very true in fact if you looked at compared the traumatic stress with, or, or extreme stress with uh, flow, a lot of the same systems were being utilized. They're both altered states of consciousness. They're very different. They share some overlap, complete focus and you know, things like that. But I, I started asking myself, well, why does one experience become trauma and one experience become flow? And it led to a thought experiment. It's really a hypothetical but it's based on like such real world phenomenon that like there are big exact studies on this phenomenon and there we have videos of it. And so it was really easy to visualize. But the question was, you're a motorcyclist, you're driving down the freeway, you get cut off by a car. Now, one of two things could happen. Maybe there are other experiences, but there are two really common responses. You swerve around the car, the swerve goes remarkably well. And by the time you're on the other side and you're driving away, you're in flow. Right, you've got, and with all of the core phenomenological characteristics of flow are showing up, or same exact swerve, nothing is different other than, oh my God, I didn't feel in control and it scared me. And now I'm driving down the freeway feeling, feeling traumatic stress. And it is the possible kind of situation that can lead to PTSD. So the question was, what the hell, like what, first of all, it gave me a framework for thinking about the problem because it's, you're really talking about at max two seconds. So it went from this like really complicated challenge. How do you figure out what's going on in the brain in flow or all this other stuff to what's going on in the brain in these two seconds. And some of what happens in those two seconds, first few seconds of flow 
are literally already dictated by the experience, right? We know, for example, the experience is gonna start with activity in the salience network because if that's the network that detects novel, unexpected stimuli, right? So we had a starting point. Okay, this whole experience, doesn't matter where everybody's brains are ahead of time, the experience starts when the salience network detects the car and it ends when you either drive off with traumatic stress or drive off with flow. And that way of, oh my God, we've got this hugely complicated thing and suddenly it's crunched down and I just have to go moment by moment. And if, if you look at like how fast things happen in the brain, right? In a sense, the fastest they're, they're gonna be able to take place is sort of within the gamma cycle. And we, we know how, how long that is. Like we know, we, we know what that is. So we could actually even chunk it down further and say, okay, you know, there are going to be 10 milliseconds that we got to account for here and 10 more here. And so it's, those are 20 data points rather than a million things we have to try to figure out. And to me, that felt like a very solvable problem. And because the motorcycle hypothesis that being cut off by a, by a car had been studied, Mm -hmm. already like people had done research and fmri work and things like that and what happens when you get cut off by some of the gaps were already filled in so it was i felt it was a very contained form for like this puzzle that like you know i've been staring at flow state onset for 25 years and i couldn't even find a way in suddenly i had a way in this framework has turned out to yeah. be really useful for thinking about you know, a lot of the questions we have about brain stuff are these large scale processes, consciousness, you know, those sort of, these sorts of flow, these sorts of big questions, they're super complicated to wrap your head around. And I like this, this framework of like the onset of the experience as a, just as a starting point, as a way to get a toehold into these really complicated multi-layer processes where there's so much stuff going on, even if you want to take things down to the molecular genetic level, which we didn't do in this time frame, you could still do it. You're, you, sure. you, the scale is right that, you know, all that stuff is good. So I, I think it's a tool for, for anybody looking to think about, you know, these kinds of hard problems. I think it's a, it's a useful thing.